Thank you. Kathy Beals is smiling at me, so we must be ready to go. So today <clears throat> we're entering into what I call the meat and potatoes of this class because we're gonna start our journey through the uh, gospel accounts of the resurrection. Today we do Mark and then uh, John. So I'll try to give equal time to both of those. <clears throat> and then uh, next week we do the other two synoptic gospels, Luke and Matthew. So today, uh, let's begin with Mark. And what I would like to do, I know I see a few of you have a Bible in hand, but I'm, I'm going to do a, the first two, three texts. I'm going to read them because in order to understand Mark's um, focus on the resurrection, we need to look at those three predictions that he did on the journey towards Jerusalem. Now, let me just back up a minute and say something about Mark. You all know, I think by this time, that Mark is the first gospel to be written and was most likely written right near the destruction of Jerusalem. Hence that apocalyptic message of Mark in chapter 13. And scholars are not clear about when he wrote it, but it's in that time period. And Mark is a gospel that is more comfortable with the Gentile Christian community than the Jewish community. But he covers both. One of the strategies that you hear in Mark and you don't hear it so much in the other two synoptics is he has six crossings of the Sea of Galilee. And in each case, he goes across to the Gentile side on the Eastern side and does a power act and then comes back across to the Jewish side and does another power act. And so you can see in this section of, uh, act of Mark, those crossings are really significant because they symbolize the gospel going both to the Gentile community and to the Christian community. So that's kind of the background to the gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of the synoptic gospels but both Matthew and Luke rely on it because it gives them the primary structure for doing their gospel stories. Hence, you know, they're called the synoptics, but, uh, and, and there's many cases where they are similar. Uh, the three stories we're gonna hear now are uh, all repeated in both uh, Matthew and Luke but there's some major differences. And that's, that's why you have biblical scholars who spend their lifetime studying that stuff because they try to decipher uh, what's going on. And they've had a field day with this part of the Gospel of Mark, the resurrection story, because it's um, in some ways different, but also the core structure is similar to not only the other two synoptics, but also to the Gospel of John. So I'm going to begin with, in any, each of these predictions, there is a prediction that Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. And then there is misunderstanding by the disciples. And then there is a teaching component because Jesus tries to correct this misunderstanding of the disciples. So I don't have to read all of these, but I'm gonna start particularly with the first one, which is in uh, Mark chapter eight, verse 31. 
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And this phrase happens all three times. And after three days rise again. So the resurrection motif is central to the Gospel of Mark, even though Mark does not have any resurrection appearances. Because the resurrection is a statement of belief rather than based on appearances, which when uh, Luke and Matthew get on the board, they have to have resurrection appearances. But it was not proof of the resurrection. It was just a statement of fact, a reality, a belief system. So um, then he said all of this quite openly. Here's the dispute part, and here's the misunderstanding. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's a very strong word in the Greek. I've got scolding him. Yeah, and it's even stronger than that. I mean, it's if we were going to use common day language, come on, you asshole, get with it. <laughs> so, um, and Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not... Um, setting your mind on divine things, but on human things. And then the teaching part com commences after this. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them themselves take up their cross and follow me. And then it goes on. So that's the first one in uh, Mark 8. The second one comes in Mark 8, 9, and it's very similar. So they went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone else to know it, for he was teaching the disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed in human hands. They will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. The same sort of prediction, but the predictions are a little bit different in each case, but what is constant is he will rise again on the third day. And then the third one is in chapter 10 of Mark beginning at verse 33. And where they were on the road, which is a theme of Mark, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, which is an interesting thing. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And he told the 12 aside, and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying that we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles, the Romans, and they will mock him and spit upon him and flog him. So there's added images here and kill him, and after three days, he will rise again. The same last word that after three days. Yes? He never said I. No, in each day, in each case, he's saying, this is what's going to happen to me, but he doesn't say, I am going to rise up. He just, he will rise up again. Yes? Any idea why? Well, um, in the synoptic tradition, Jesus does not in any place claim to be the Son of God or claim miraculous power. 
And in fact, in Mark, we'll see a little later on, there was the Messianic secret, which was when something happens, don't tell anybody. And it will come out at the very end of Mark's gospel, uh, the Messianic secret influences how the gospel ends. So those are the three, if you wish, the three preludes to, I better stay here so they can see me, preludes to uh, Mark's story. Now, here comes a place where I would like somebody to read, if you would. Um, the resurrection story begins in chapter 16, but before that, we have the women at the resurrection and the burial. Chapter 15, 40 through 47. If somebody would read that. Some women were watching from distance including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger one. And Joseph and Salome. When Jesus <clears throat> was in Galilee, these women had followed and supported him along with many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him. Since it was late in the afternoon on preparation day, just before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea <coughs> decide, no, dared to approach Pilate and ask for Jesus' body. Joseph was a prominent council member who also eagerly anticipated the coming of God's kingdom. Pilate wondered if Jesus was already dead. He called the centurion and asked him whether Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, Pilate gave the dead body to Joseph. He bought a linen cloth, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. He rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was buried. So that's the key part is the women. Uh, remember the disciples had all fled in the garden scene. Uh, Peter hung around forbidden till he denied Jesus and then he fled. So the only spectators left of this group was the women. And who gets mentioned prominently in the list of the women? Mary Magdalene. And um, the um, early church was uncomfortable with Mary Magdalene having such prominence because it's a male world after all. But Mary Magdalene in the earliest church was acknowledged as the first of the witnesses because she is listed not only in Mark's version, but also in John and in the other two synoptics, Mary Magdalene. Well, here's the problem. In Judaism at that time, a woman could not be a witness of anything. She couldn't go to the trial to be a witness so here we have Mary Magdalene being the witness, the primary witness. It's no wonder the early church had a little uncomfortableness with that. And by the time we get to the Gospel of John, which we will deal with shortly, Mary Magdalene is still uh, introduced but then we're given the aside that she's the one from whom the seven or how many demons were cast out. So casting this pale on her honor. What's the latest on thinking that Mary, Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife? 
Well, I don't know the natives, but I mean, there was a book written about that. <laughs> um, certainly there were apocryphal gospels and stories that fleshed out that idea. And if I just might be uh, bold enough to say, a group of bachelor board boys running around doing this and doing that was not common at all in ancient Judaism. A monastic tradition, maybe. But these boys were around with Jesus all the time. So the assumption is because Peter is the only one who is specifically acknowledged to be married because they came to his house and his mother-in-law was sick, they assume all the other ones were also bachelors. Well, if they weren't bachelors, why do we think Jesus was a bachelor? Well, because we don't like the whole sex thing, you know? So, <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the likelihood that Jesus was married and had a family is more likely than the other way around. But we have that tradition, and it's based on how the patriarchal church didn't know how to deal with women, especially strong women, because if Mary Magdalene is mentioned first, she must have had a pretty prominent role amongst the women, a bigger role than uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She appears, but she doesn't appear in the same kind of context. So that's one issue dealing with these uh, women who were hanging out, who watched the death of Jesus, who watched the burial. And by the way, this is how come when you come later to the actual resurrection scene, Mary Magdalene knew where the tomb was because she was there and watched it. And Joseph, of, and this will come up a little bit later, but Joseph of Arimathea did what was normally to do with a body. In another text, it says that he wrapped him in spices, embalming. In this one, he just wrapped him in a linen cloth. So, um, Jesus had a proper burial. And the image of that may come out later on when we deal with John. So. What about the women? You could say that they were disciples. Well, yeah. And the interesting thing is in the Gospel of Mark, the male disciples all failed Jesus at the end. But the women were right there. They were with him throughout. It might say something about the role of women in the life of the church. <laughs> All right. Um, I would like us now, if we can, to go to the next chapter, which is chapter uh, 16 of Mark, and have somebody read verses 1 through 6 of 16. And I'll tell you why we skipped verse 7. Read 1 through, okay, here's how I want you to do it. Read 1 through 6, skip 7, and read 8. Okay? <clears throat> and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, of, G, of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. And entering the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on, a, on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, be not affrighted, 
Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they had laid him. So that's verse six, right? And then jump to verse eight. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. And they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they were any thing to a man. I'm sorry. Neither said they anything to a man, for they were afraid. Okay. So that's how the gospel of Mark ends. With the women being afraid and not saying anything to anyone. End of story. Because Mark, as I mentioned earlier, was not dependent on resurrection appearances. Because for Mark, it was sufficient to say he is risen. That's what's important. And in fact, in the early church, that was Jesus Christ was crucified and is risen. And that was enough. Now, it also could be that by time Mark wrote his story in the uh, 70s, which would be some 30 years after the life and death of Jesus, it could be that the resurrection appearance stories had not really begun to circulate in the way that they did when the other synoptic gospels were written. I mean, that's all speculative. But the fact that he didn't have appearances has disturbed all kinds of people because, you know, that's what verifies the resurrection is the resurrection appearance, uh, according to our mindset. But it may not have been for the Gospel of Mark's mindset. Now, we skipped verse 7. Will somebody read verse 7? But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall he see him, and he said unto you. So, going into Galilee. The most scholars that I have read say that part of the story is a different tradition that God inserted into Mark's gospel story. And I might say to you that um, it was not uncommon, both in New Testament times and in Old Testament times, that people played around with the text. If the text didn't say quite what it should have, well, they'll add to it. So hence you have, in which we won't read now until next time, that ending to the Gospel of Mark, which um, is appended to Mark, but it's not part of the original text of Mark. And so it's as likely that that was added on as this verse 7, which gives a different tradition about Jesus, and that is the resurrection scenes, and this is particularly in the Gospel of Luke, is in Galilee. In Mark's version, as well as Matthew and John, all of the resurrection appearances are right in Jerusalem. When you read some of the um, stories of the Middle Ages, when the monks would copy the scriptures, they would insert also comments, um, change a word here and there, and they'd write it along the edge but eventually those comments got included in the original text. And so that's another thing. In those days, people weren't terribly, um, or they didn't consider scripture so sacred that they wouldn't play around with it. Yeah, and hence one of the tasks of, you know, if you're a theology professor or whatever, you try to discern what is the original text and you deal with that or you deal with 
things that God added, which are not necessarily part of the original text. So hence, the assumption of uh, most of the people I've read is chapter uh, verse seven, which has them going, Jesus going into Galilee, was an insertion from a different tradition, which is the tradition that uh, the Gospel of Luke particularly refers to, because in Luke, all of the resurrection appearances are in Galilee, not in Jerusalem. So now, um, one of the things that we have to sort of look at is, oh, here we got some other comments over here. Some more words of wisdom. <laughs> well, I have a Bible I picked up in, in the 60s, yeah. I believe. It's a Catholic Bible. Right. Okay. It has two versions of the episode that was just read. One is the short and one is the long. Yeah. The long one is what was added to the Gospel of Mark. It's not in the earliest texts. In the way the biblical scholars, they have dating on these different texts. And so they have been able to decipher which are the earliest texts. And therefore, that's how they uh, conclude that the Gospel of Mark originally ended with verse 8. But then later on, these other additions appear. And of course, it was, you know, because the Christian community wanted to have appearances. And Mark didn't have them. So they wanted to correct them. So you're right. Those two different uh, endings of the Gospel of Mark are there. At that time, when the Bibles were written, and the church at that time, all the debates that went on about interpretation. Then as well as now. <laughs> yeah, it's, still, it's still going on. I mean, you know. It's, it's... Yes, I mean, it's been a, um, a continuous thing. Now, when the first gospel was written, Mark, because he was the first one to write it in um, an actual written language, oral tradition had already been going on before that. So Mark could rely on oral tradition because he had a right to rely on everything. He was an, not an eyewitness of anything that happened in the gospel. It was all based on oral tradition that he acquired. And um, some people don't think that oral tradition is reliable, but there's a lot of histories and cultures in the world where oral tradition was the main way that history was uh, transmitted to oncoming generations. So we got a couple guys back there. Yeah, the, uh, when you talk about the added endings, uh, as with other things, it gets curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> uh, there, there was a scholar in the 60s uh, whose name I cannot recall, uh, who thought that the story we just read was also an addition and that the uh, uh, gospel properly ended with the uh, uh, centurion's proclamation uh, when Jesus died that he was the son of God. Yeah, I have heard of that uh, um, mm -hmm. conclusion. I don't think it fits well with the documentation that I have been able, I mean, I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar, but it doesn't fit with the documentation that I've been able to read in terms of how the original script was fairly intact. But uh, certainly theologically, if you wish, the centurion's comment, this truly was the son of God, you could say that is really a good theological ending because it it seals who Jesus was, the Son of God. Yeah, it's better than you know the ending where the women 
witness the empty tomb and they flee in terror and don't say anything to anybody. Yeah. Were you going to say something, John? I thought you were. <laughs> I have questions about the timing of this. If yeah. it was 30 years later or so. Yeah, Jesus, I mean, most historians are pretty clear that Jesus was born sometime around the beginning of the Common Era. There's some uncertainty about whether it was 3 BC or after, but because they can date it, date it based on the listing of the kings and governors who exercised ministry during that time. So, and then based on the comment that Jesus lived for 30 years, the crucifixion then was when he was 33 years old or 30 years old. That's hard to date in terms of an exact date because in the Roman annals where they list stuff like that, that's not listed as a crucifixion. But Mark's gospel was the first one. Yes. And it was how much later than the occurrence of things, 60 years? Well, Mark was so, written right was around it? the fall of Jerusalem. Matthew and Luke followed some 10, 15, maybe even as much as 20 years later. And when was and, the fall of? And then John is uh, some 40 years after all of that. When was the fall of Jerusalem? 70 AD. That's a historical. Okay. So that's 40 odd years after. And it was based after the fall of Jerusalem was after a long siege of Jerusalem by the Roman army, which was as horrific as what's going on now. I mean, sieges of cities and of countries is terrible. These apostles must have been pretty old when they wrote there. Mm -hmm. The apostles then must have been pretty old when they wrote there. The apostles didn't write it. Disciples. That's part of the misunderstanding oh. is none of the gospels that we have okay. were written by eyewitnesses, apostles. They were written by some other unknown writer, but not, I mean... When I grew up in the Baptist church, of course, there are eyewitness accounts, and they were written soon after the life of Jesus. Well, that kind of uh, chronology is not accepted by most biblical scholars nowadays. So um, we have this issue of the silence of the women. One nuance of it is in the Gospel of Mark, as well as in the other synoptics, frequently when Jesus does an act of power, a healing, what does he say? Don't say anything to anyone. Keep it a secret. So that's underlying Mark's story, so there's a certain sense in which these women, knowing that, said, well, we're not going to say anything to anyone. But they did, of course, because the word did spread. But it may relate to why they were quiet or why they were silent. And maybe they knew that 2,000 years later, biblical scholars would be wrestling with this. <laughs> so, well, that, that's another underlying issue, particularly in Mark. In Mark, whenever there is any kind of thing about going to Galilee, Mark thought the parousia, the second coming, was going to happen soon and in Galilee. So Mark doesn't have them going to Galilee, but that Galilee tradition was part of that uh, eminence of the uh, parousia of the, that's a Bible, not a Bible, is it in the Bible? I don't know, but it's, 
It's our way of talking about the second coming, the end of the world. So um, then I want to just touch base on one thing. We're talking about resurrection appearances and the lack of them in Mark. If you remember last week, we read Paul's version of the second of the resurrection. Remember that? Let's turn to that. First Corinthians 15, three through eight. <clears throat> Chapter 15 of First Corinthians, verses three through eight. <clears throat> Now, remember, the uh, epistle of Corinthians was written at least 20 years before the Gospel of Mark, written in the 50s when uh, Paul was active in his ministry. And his ministry dates can be fairly accurately uh, detailed because of different things that happened and so on. So somebody want to read that little text? Again, <clears throat> for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are, are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me. So, on first hearing that, we would think, here is Paul talking about appearances as if they happened. But what he has is a list. It's not a list of appearances. I mean, there are appearances, but they're not detailing the, the appearances. It's just a list. And of course, he got it from what was already circulating around. And some of the parts of that story, the whole sequence of things is different from what we find in most of the synoptic accounts, or even John, the one glaring difference is appeared to 500. There's nowhere you find that in any other gospel account of Jesus appearing to 500 people at one time. So Paul is in this text of 1 Corinthians, which is his primary text on dealing with the theology of the resurrection, because that's central to his work as a missionary, uh, he just gives this list of these appearances, but does not detail what the appearances are. So you just might wonder that, you know, how does Paul fit into this whole sequence um, of appearances? And they're not appearances, they're just a list that he got from other places. All right, so um, one of the things that I would like us to continue with, remember in our first session, I gave you this um, uh, reading from Norman Perrin about myth, and he distinguishes between primordial myth and uh, what he calls uh, constitutional or some other kind of myth. He refers particularly to the myths relating to the formation of this country. Primordial is more archetypical. And he argues, Norman Perrin does, that the story of the resurrection in Mark is primordial myth, it's archetypical. But he's still using the term of it being myth. So, um, one of the things that I think we might stumble on is we're inclined to want to say when we get to the other 
gospel accounts, that these were real life in person appearances rather than um, what we might call, um, where do I have that? Oh, I think I have that on the John's thing. Revelatory encounters, not physical experiences. That's kind of the way that particularly Norman Perrin and some others distinguish between what appear to be in-person physical experiences. Like a vision? Well, sort of like it. I mean, um, most of us, when we have a vision encounter, it's in our dreams. But sometimes some people do have real vision experiences that are not in dreams, but they're not physical reality. They're, a, uh, they're more mythic. And that's kind of the way most of the New Testament scholars look at the resurrection stories of Jesus. My dad, who was a United Church of Christ uh, pastor, I, I, I got a whole bunch of uh, his sermons. He, he was a manuscript preacher. And one of them is titled, The, the Resurrection as a Spiritual Experience mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than Physical. Yeah, and I think that most of these scholars that I have read would look at it in that same way. Whereas, at least where I grew up as a Baptist, it was they were physical, real. And one of the things that we'll deal with next time in um, the Gospel of uh, Luke is, did Jesus eat fish? If he was a spiritual being, could he actually eat and consume something? And we'll wrestle with that next time. So I think that's most of what I want to say about Mark. And so now I'd like us to turn to the Gospel of John. Now remember, oh, before we get there. So Paul wrote his... Some, Acts, etc. before the Gospels were yeah, in Paul writing. Wrote so his the, was all from oral. His also was over because he said, I got this and I'm giving it to you. So the oral tradition of appearances was already circulating during Paul's time. Did they think that perhaps his enlightenment to, from the, the Lord Mm -hmm. which is what converted him, gave him in some semblance for what the truth was and what the oral was being transmitted. No, I think he, you know, it's clear when you look at the story of Paul's life, he had the encounter on the road to Damascus. And for two years, he hung tight, mingling with other Christians before he even went to Jerusalem. And so he was interacting with a lot of people from the early church. And so the stories, if you wish, about Jesus appearing in his resurrection were thung, ones that he could easily sort of put into a list format. But his, you know, 1 Corinthians is accurately dated for around 50-something A.D., and then uh, the Gospels some 20 years later. So that's why a lot of people say the earliest resurrection stories are in Corinthians, but they really are not resurrection stories as such because they don't tell what happened. It's just a list of things. All right, let's go to John chapter 20. That's the... Uh, but. Like we did with uh, Mark, let's backtrack a bit and um, do the burial scene, which is in chapter 19, verse 31 through 42. If somebody would read that. <clears throat> 
uh, chapter 19, verses 31 through 42. These are, this is the burial scene. My 19 only goes through 21. Hmm? Uh, yeah, no wonder. <laughs> Written out of the same school, the what they call the Johannine school, but <laughs> yes, forty-two through basically the end of the chapter. Yeah. It was the preparation day and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, especially since that Sabbath was an important day. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of those crucified broken and the bodies taken down. <clears throat> Therefore, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who were crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw this has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he speaks the truth, and he has testified so that you also can believe. These things happen to fulfill the scripture. They won't break any of his bones. And another scripture says, they will look at him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body <clears throat> of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the Jewish <clears throat> My, <clears throat> but he feared the Jewish authorities. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the one who at first had come to Jesus at night, was there too. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, nearly 75 pounds in all. Following Jewish burial customs, they took Jesus' body, wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths. There was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever lay, been lay, laid, because it was the Jewish preparation day, and the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus in it. Okay, so in this story, different than what we heard in Mark, there's no women. There's no women watching, there's no women, uh, but Mary Magdalene later will find out did know where the tomb was. But she's not listed at least in this story and we'll come to a comment about why that might be in John's telling. Now remember, John is right around the turn of the century, maybe even into the early second century when he writes his story. So quite a lot has gone on already with the early church and how they are trying to define and understand who they are and if you might say, who is in power? Who's in charge? All right, so that's the burial scene. One thing that's interesting in this story is Nicodemus, who appears early in the Gospel of John, joins up with Joseph of Arimathea. And in John's rendition, they do do the pop proper burial customs of basically embalming the body and wrapping it in a linen cloth. So um, that's the before the resurrection story, yes. This is really little, but you know how we were saying sometimes a lot gets lost, I guess, in the translation or because it was oral for so long. So th and this is the minorest thing, but um, 
in the one that was read, it was something about the um, spices and all, and I think 70 pounds. Now mine says a hundred pounds. I'm like, <laughs> who, you know, who decided, you know, just throwing it to me. I mean, that's kind of random, but if they were random about those things, well, the big things you really wonder. You could, you'd have to be a Greek scholar to know what the Greek word was. For in my guess would be, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but my guess would be the Greek is more like a large quantity. And how do you measure what a large quantity is? So hence you have different things in English about how large a quantity this was. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to chapter 20 um, of John. This is the core part of the resurrection scene story. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial clause there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cross there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial clause, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned home. Did okay, you? so that's uh, what we have there. What we first heard was Mary Magdala, who is the first, but then followed by Peter and John. What we will find out later, and we'll hear it, is Mary Magdala gets diminished as the story goes on. But uh, and Peter and John are both running. John is faster, but who gets promoted? It's Peter. Because by that time in the life of the church, Peter was becoming recognized as the first bishop of the church. Hence, Peter and Peter being the source of the Pope. Okay, you read through verse 11, I think, didn't you? So can you read on through till uh, verse 18? Because that picks up the story of Mary Magdala again. <clears throat> But Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she bent over the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you laid him and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, 
which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary of Magdala went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and what he told her. Okay, so that picks up the story of Mary again after we have the kind of interruption of Peter and John racing to the tomb. It's kind of an interesting aside because it doesn't appear anywhere else except that Peter and John were both close to Jesus, but Peter is the one that has to be affirmed as being priority. And so you have that little nuance that happens in that story and more decidedly as it goes on. Um, my translation says, um, don't hold on to me for I haven't yet gone to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some English translations try to clean up the sort of male dominant <laughs> language that has prevailed through uh, New Testament translations. So this thing of don't hold on to me, biblical scholars have always wrestled with what does that mean? Hence, you get the nuance of, well, was Mary the wife of Jesus and hanging on to him? Or there's a, a tradition we will hear next time in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says a similar thing to the women who grab his feet. So um, it's like, hold on, hang on, don't leave me type of thing. But, you know, it's not exactly clear just what was meant by Jesus saying that. Where it says, um, according to the scriptures. Right. Constantly. What are they referring to? Some um, stories in the Old Testament? I mean, everybody has read the Old Testament or orally were told all those stories that they could constantly refer back to the Old Testament? It's a style that John uses, but he doesn't specify what the scriptures are. I mean... Um, it, so it may not be the Old may, Testament? It may not be whatever. It's just John's style of establishing the authenticity. Wow. And when you get... To the Gospel of Matthew, you have a very different nuance because Matthew, who is doing his gospel to the Jewish community, has all kinds of references to the Old Testament. And so when Matthew says, thus fulfills, and then he gives a quote of what scripture text from the Old Testament is being referred to, John doesn't do that. He just says, hence, fulfilling what isn't there. I mean, but you can, when it gets to the place of the breaking of the bones, and John quotes that, that is an actual text from the Psalms. So there's some places where he does do that specifically, and others not. Okay. A couple of points. One, one just kind of a minor point, um, but this is a pretty energetic gospel. Everybody's running all over the place, <laughs> and uh, you know, like Douglas, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, pretty, yeah, particularly uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh -huh. that however far it was from the tomb to where the disciples are hiding out, uh, she's run this distance three times. <laughs> uh, she runs there. She runs back with them. She runs there to you know tell them. Uh, That's um, a good the, point. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the other, the more significant thing here, I think, is that uh, uh, even, even though uh, uh, we've got, uh, uh, as this goes on in later stories, uh, showing the uh, the positions of uh, of uh, Peter and uh, John, 
um, in terms of the authority in the church. Uh, nevertheless, Mary Magdalene is still the first one to have seen the risen Jesus. Right, right. Which they were uncomfortable with that. <laughs> so a couple little other nuances in this text. She says... And later, when we have the encounter between her and Jesus, she presumes he's the gardener. And in her first encounter with the angelic presence, she assumes that somebody, the gardener or somebody, took away the body of Jesus. There is a tradition, it's not well fleshed out, but there was a person named Judas who was a gardener, who supposedly in some obscure writing claimed to be the gardener who stole the body. It's not acclaimed very much in any other apocryphal writings, but it's there. So, but it was in the garden. Remember, that's where we were told that where the sepulcher was, was in the garden. And so the gardener would be a presence. All right. Um, one of the terms that is used often, and we'll hear this later, when, um, let's see, we stopped at verse 18, right, of um, John 20. We didn't have the encounter with Jesus yet in that story, did we? Okay, let's go on with that encounter. On the evening of the first day of that week, when the doors were locked and the disciples were... No, before that, isn't there the encounter between Jesus and Mary? No, that we already said that. Oh, okay. That came up already? Okay. Then I just yeah. want to make a comment about that because um, she doesn't recognize Jesus and assumes he is the gardener. Okay, I'm sorry. We were in a, we were did that. Okay, go on now. <laughs> <laughs> this boat is going slow. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll just start there. On, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. And you might as well go on to the rest of that chapter. Thomas. Yeah, with well, Thomas. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the doors, or although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. <laughs> 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief, you may have life in his name. Okay, so that is the ending of the Gospel of John. You listen to those last two verses, and it is really a concluding kind of ending. But then at some point, chapter 21 of John gets added to the gospel story. And we'll, we'll look at that, but it just is important to note that the original ending of the gospel of John is those two concluding verses. Uh, once I gave a sermon entitled Doubting Thomas is my favorite disciple, <laughs> the, po pointing to the value of doubt in moving you to what you can accept as true. Yeah, I think uh, we have misnamed him Doubting Thomas. I've often referred to him as the empirical Thomas. Because like a good scientist, he wants to verify whatever has been said and do it within the test tube. <laughs> so I think you're right. I mean, um, Thomas has been maligned by referring to him as Doubting Thomas, and we still do that. I mean, how often have I had somebody say to me, are you a Doubting Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> He must have come from Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> well, that was a long time in making. <laughs> Whenever I hear that story, I think if it was me, say if we were here and Jesus decided to walk in, I'd believe, but I'd probably say no, just so I'd have an excuse to touch him. I, you know, I want to, wouldn't want to miss the opportunity. And if Jesus was, the term that's often used is a Christophany, that is an appearance of Jesus, what would you feel when you touched him? So, I mean, there's, there's an ambiguity there in terms of dealing with what really was this resurrected body of Jesus. One little nuance that I want to get at, and this goes back to the scene of uh, Peter and John coming to the tomb. They see the cloths, but at least one reference I saw said, the cloths are not like when you get out of bed and you throw off the covers. It's rather they're there, and it's almost like the body escaped out of the cause. And I thought, wow, that's a fascinating kind of take <laughs> on what they both saw in the uh, empty tomb. So anyway, that was just a little thing I wanted to throw into there. So um, let's do a quick little thing into John 21. And um, there's really primarily one two major stories in John 21 that we need to hear. Remember again, this was attached to John after the gospel was completed. Mary Heisman, are you looking to, oh. Mary or Mary. Okay. <laughs> How far? We're starting in beginning at 21? Yes. Do uh, first 1 through 13, and then we'll do the rest of the chapter later. Okay. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, 
Zebedee's sons and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will come with you. So they went, went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net with the fish. When they climbed out on the shore, they saw a charcoal fire with, it, with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. <laughs> Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them, and in like manner, the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. All right, so... Um, there's several little nuances in this text that are interesting. One is the very ending of it is Eucharistic, isn't it? Jesus is dividing the bread and the fish. And, and by the way, in some of the earliest traditions of Eucharist, it was fish and bread that was part of the Eucharistic meal because it was in a, uh, the Sea of Galilee was a fish town. So um, that's a, a significant part of this story. The other one that always is, I found fascinating is 153 fish. <laughs> well, yeah, but what I was told, at least in reading one commentary, is that the people who knew something about the other nations and peoples around the world, they came up with 153 different peoples, groups of peoples. Mm -hmm. Now, how they came up with that number, I don't know, but it's kind of symbolic of this new Christian community being sent out into the world. And, um, their goal is to catch fish. Um, so the other thing that I think is uh, interesting is in the Synoptic Gospels, we have Peter and Andrew and John and uh, James being called from their fishing to follow Jesus. So we can at least acknowledge from the synoptic tradition that they were fishermen. But that was quite a while ago. And here's Peter saying, I'm going to go fishing again. And all seven or six of the other disciples, none of which we know of as being any fishermen, say, oh, we're going to go with you. So <laughs> it's kind of an interesting, but it connects with the idea that going out into the world is a fishing expedition. You're going out to spread the good news to people who do not know it. So that's, um, and by the way, you will remember this, we don't have to look at it, but in Luke chapter five is another fishing story. <laughs> 
very similar to this one, where Jesus is standing on the shore and saying, have you caught anything? And then says, uh, cast it over on the other side. And then they get a catch of fish that's so big that the nets are almost ready to break. So it's a very similar story out of the synoptic tradition. So uh, John, of course, would know that story. And he inserts it here as a post-resurrection story rather than where it is in the Gospel of Luke as something early on in the life of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. As 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 we've been talking, uh, thinking here, uh, you know, we we know that uh, uh, you know Luke Acts is a two volume work, right? Uh, the story of Jesus, the story of the church, and it almost seems like John twenty one here is kind of like a a hint of a second volume, mm -hmm. uh, because we we started out with the appearance uh, in uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but now we're in Galilee. We're, now we're in Galilee, we're, right? You know, we are yeah. under the country, and uh, uh, as as you uh, describe these verses for us, uh, you know we we're, we're really looking ahead to the spread of Christianity now, and the uh, the building of the of the church. So it's kind of like a, in Galilee, at least in this framework, was the place of the Gentiles. Actually, yeah. So it was you know going to the Gentiles with the good news okay, yes yeah. and, and then interestingly this... we didn't mention it uh, uh but in mark uh you know the uh, uh message that the women didn't deliver because they were afraid was that jesus was going to meet the disciples in in galilee yeah right uh, not in jerusalem so uh, right yeah we're we're, we're pointing we're pointing to that second volume that didn't get written <laughs> <laughs> somebody could say that <laughs> All right, so I, we have one more little story in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. It begins at verse 15, I think. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple from uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved following, <clears throat> which also leaned on him on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, said, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that this disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is a disciple which testif testifies of these things and wrote these things, 
and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. <laughs> All right, so that is the second ending, if you wish, of the Gospel of John. Uh, the ending based on the addition to the Gospel of John. Um, what I think is significant in this story is the redemption of Peter. Because remember in the trial scene, Peter denied three times. And his denials were pretty strong. I mean, the... Uh, Translation says he cursed when he denied that he knew Jesus. So if Peter is going to be the head of the church, we can't have this guy being the head of the church, so he has to be redeemed somehow. And it's pretty clear that John inserted this little story as a way of, because by that time in the first, second century, the church was already getting organized and it already had bishops and uh, the ascendancy of Peter was already emerging as a primary motif in the life of the early church. Um, the little addition at the end about John is probably the Johannine school way of just Affirming John, even though he's not Peter, affirming his role in the life of the church. And of course, the Johannine community was an important component of the early life of the church. So we have managed to go through these two gospels and we still have another few minutes. If anybody has any last words of wisdom, Mary Claire does. I don't know if they call that words of wisdom, but just a couple observations. Two things in that last part we just did. Um, the part about all the fish and the 153 fish. Well, you know, in in Greece, in the what the Greek Orthodox churches, they paint like frescoes or whatever on every square inch of everything. Right. Yeah. And when we were there, we went to this little, little church. I mean, it was more like a chapel in the middle of like Athens, but it was on its own private little mountain almost. And that scene was painted on the wall. I mean, so it was like you almost had a bend back. It was just there. So to somebody, that was a biggie in the gospel that they they chose to do it that I, I i should bring i bought the postcard of it because it would just you know it just really jumped out at you and then the other thing in verse 18 um in her translation where it said verily i say to you in mine it says amen amen mm -hmm. and at some class i was at i don't know on bible we were told that whenever it says, amen, amen, it's like, hey, listen up. I'm going to say something important. <laughs> so um, I don't know. So that's one of them. Yes, right. Because that, that was an old English phrase, verily, verily, I say to you. So that came from the King James Version. But um, other translations don't use that sort of archaic language. But you could try it. You, sometime when you want to make sure somebody believes you, say, verily I say unto you. <laughs> I don't remember all that much from my uh, seminary Greek, uh, but the, uh, the phrase in Greek is, amen, amen, logosoi. Truly, truly, I say to you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, what we have in the traditional trans translations is really quite literal yeah right truly truly i say to you right well, man we ought to refer these greek things to you <laughs> <laughs> all right friends well we have pretty much done the 
uh, first and last gospel accounts of the resurrection. So next week, can you believe we've already done three weeks? We're almost done. Man, oh man. So next week we do uh, Luke and uh, Matthew. Scholars are sort of undecided about which one preceded. They're both clear that they were borrowing from Mark. And they both had a common source, which is called Q, because there's material that is familiar to both of them that's not in Mark. But they also both have very independent stories. So, um, and of course, as John already mentioned, the writer of Luke is also the writer of uh, the book of Acts. All right, friends, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> I think the party is still 